Okay. Now, I wondered if we should just take all of Daniel. So we can ponder that tonight. But we're jumping right into chapter 9 here. And you notice it's the first year of Darius, son of Ashwaras, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So what we want to notice first is that um, Daniel gives us the time. It's the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, and he's of Median descent. You know, this is just after the takeover of Wow, let's think about this now. Went from Babylon. So Babylon to the Median, Media, Mede, and Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so Daniel is somewhere around 80 to 90 years old, right here. And it says, in the first year of his reign, that Daniel observed the number of the years, which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet. Now, rise. So, this is maybe, maybe, within a generation after Jeremiah, because Jeremiah prophesied during the fall of Judah. So this is no more than 70 years later. And some people think it's around 68 or 69. So Daniel read the scroll of Jeremiah, which, again, it's acknowledged. He is a prophet. Everything that he prophesied to Judah happened. So now Daniel is reading in the word of the Lord, the, the written book, and he says, you know what? It's 70 years for the desolation of Jerusalem. And he says, it's over. Now, he knew even then that Jeremiah the prophet is the word of the Lord. And it says in Jeremiah that it would be 70 years that Jerusalem would lay desolate. It would fulfill its Sabbaths, which they never observed. Jeremiah 25. All right. Why don't you read that? Um, verse 11. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And then it says, then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord. Okay. So <clears throat> there's also something else we learn that God has punished the Babylonians already because now the Medes and the Persians rule. They took over. So... There's something else 
in the word of the Lord that's been fulfilled. So it says in verse 3, So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Does anybody know what sackcloth is? All it's right. It's made... Pardon? It's a rough type material, isn't it? It is. It's very plain. Yeah, it's scratchy, uncomfortable. It's coarse. Yes, yes. literally like sacks. <laughs> yes. You bet. Uh, imagine yes. if your clothing were made of that stuff. It would be yes. uncomfortable. Yes. And that's the point. The point is, Daniel is afflicting himself. And the point of that is to humble himself before God. Because he's praying. So, any reason why he would humble himself in order to pray? Going once, going twice, three times. My attitude? Yeah. God gives grace to the humble. Mm -hmm. You don't swagger into God's presence and say, hey, man. Mm -hmm. So he's humbling himself before God. He says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we've not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to you, O Lord, but to us open shame as it is this day. To the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those who are nearby and those who are far away in all the countries to which you've driven them because of their unfaithful deeds, which they have committed against you. So what is Daniel doing here? He's presenting the post. Okay. Confessing the sins of Israel. Yeah. Yeah, he's confessing. So, you notice how he approaches God. God is the great and awesome God. God keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Does Israel qualify? Look what he says. One, we have sinned. Two, committed iniquity. Three, acted wickedly. Four, rebelled. Five, turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets. Seven, open shame belongs to us. He says, righteousness belongs to you, your God. But to us, it's our unfaithful deeds, which we have committed against you. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Now, is that a reason for God to forgive because we have rebelled against him? If God forgives, it's in spite of all their sin. That's called grace. 
And it doesn't depend on the sinner. It depends upon God alone. Is it fair to say it depends on the sinner coming into agreement with God about his sin? You bet. <laughs> is Daniel agreeing? Yes, he is. He is agreeing eight times and more with mm -hmm. God. So that's good. We've rebelled against him, nor have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us, along with the oath, which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him, that is God. So, you know, this is from Leviticus 26, also Deuteronomy. Uh, I don't see a reference here for that. My well, notes. you know, I'm reading in Deuteronomy in the evenings, and I just read through all this. Mm -hmm. So Moses explains in detail what's going to happen to Israel if they disobey the law. And Moses says, blessings if you obey the law, curses if you don't. And you know, Israel fulfilled both of those. In those times that they obeyed God, God blessed greatly. And then when they sinned against God, God cursed them. And you know, this is one of the values of the Old Testament, is that it is a paper trail showing that God is true. You know that God knew in advance that Israel would sin against him? He knew in advance that he would kick them out of the country. And he also knew in advance that he would bring them back because he is compassionate and he forgives and he is gracious And so, really, the history of Israel is a paper trail, a proof, a documentation of God's goodness and man's sin. Because, again, you can read about it in the historical books in the Old Testament that how Israel rejected God, how God was patient, Jeremiah must have prophesied over 40 years to Jerusalem, Judea, and you know, it's a documentation of how gracious God is, how stubborn sinners are. We haven't obeyed the voice of the Lord, he says. We haven't walked in his teachings. So in verse 12, he says, thus he has confirmed his words, which he had spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring on us great calamity. For under the whole heaven, there's not been done anything like what was done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us. Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us. For the Lord our God is righteous re with respect to all his deeds which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. So, you know, God is also righteous to judge. Whenever God judges, it's always righteous. And it confirms his words. Because he said there in Deuteronomy, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And if you want to read what happened, that's in Second Chronicles 
Second Kings, how Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the temple destroyed, the whole place made a desolation. You know, after everything was burned, then there began to grow back again trees and shrubs so that when Nehemiah got there to rebuild Jerusalem, there was not only rubble to get rid of, but trees. You know, an oak tree only takes about 20 years to mature. And Israel was exiled for 70 years. Think about three generations of oak trees growing up and bushes. So Jerusalem and Judah had effectively just gone to seed for all that time. So here in verse 15, Daniel begins to pray for grace. Up here, it's all confession and humbling. And let me just say this. If you don't know how else to pray, why don't you humble yourself before God and confess all the sins you can think of? It says in James, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And see, you know that it's the Lord because you wouldn't lift yourself up. But he will. He gives grace to the humble. And if you want, you can look up Charles Simeon. He was a minister in the 1700s, eight, early 1800s, and he taught his people that that's how you approach God. You humble yourself before him. And he says that, you know, when you do that, when you humble yourself before God and he lifts you up, it is amazing to experience that grace of God and he made a lot of that. And I agree with him. You feel like you don't deserve the grace of God. Guess what? You don't. And the gospel is, is that God does give grace to sinners. So embrace it. And just confess before God and see what he does. You know that uh, godly people are the only ones who repent. The wicked never repent. So if you find that you're not repenting that much, maybe you need to catch up. Because seriously... I hope you become aware of the fact that you sin all the time. It's as natural to you as breathing. Yeah. And we're unaware of it. Come into God's presence and confess your sins and see what he does. So here, Daniel turns the corner and starts asking for grace. And now, O Lord our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as it is this day, we have sinned. We have been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. 
And again, I I really like how he portrays the Lord. Have brought your people out of the land of Egypt. This goes right back to the very beginnings of the national existence of Israel. God redeemed them. And God is the Savior. And who are we? We're the sinners. We have been wicked. And so he's praying in accordance with all your righteous acts. And that means it was righteous of God to save Israel. Sinners out of Egypt. That was righteous. You know, we think of righteousness as I don't do this and I don't do that, so I must be righteous. You know what? Righteousness is what you do do. And God saved sinners out of Egypt. That's righteous. It's righteous to have compassion. And he says, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem. That means be propitiated. A propitiation is a sacrifice that turns away wrath. But you know, David says in Psalm 51 that a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, these you will not despise. The sacrifices of God are a broken heart. If you want to be acceptable to God, offer him the sacrifice of a broken heart. And a reproach. Does everybody know what a reproach is? Let's look up that one. A taunt? Hmm. Scorn, a noun meaning reproach, scorn, taunt. The term can be used for a taunt hurled at an enemy. All right. Ah, That's that from name. the word, word study Bible. All right. So here's reproach in English, an expression of rebuke or disapproval. That is, you could say, oh, you Israelite. Hey, don't be so nasty. You know, that's that's kind of what it is. Now, let's look up. What did you say that was, Greg? Um, uh, a feminine noun meaning reproach, scorn, taunt. The term can be used for taunt hurled at an enemy with an individual such as barrenness, uncircumcision, and widowhood. All right. So look at a taunt. To reproach or challenge in a mocking or insulting manner. Jeer at. Mm -hmm. To attack repeatedly with mean put-downs or insults. But back to reproach. Oh, look at that. The verb. To express disappointment in or displeasure with a person. For conduct that is blameworthy or in need of amendment, to make something a matter of reproach, to bring in discredit. So that's what Israel has become. They've blown their reputation. You could say, our name is mud. Your name doesn't mean anything. It's not worth anything. Interesting contrast to how the Lord made himself a name in verse. All right. Get that. At least that's what my, my version. Was. Sure. Yeah. As a name. How, yeah. Okay. Made a name for yourself is the phrase that it uses in the New King James Version. And what happened to their reputation? Mm hmm they blew it. Yeah. So now our God, 
listen to the prayer of your servant to his supplications. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. Not because Daniel has been fasting, not because he's wearing scratchy clothes, but for your sake, because God is compassionate. Because Israel is his people. Because the time of the desolations is coming to an end. It's been 70 years, according to your word. Yeah. Israel didn't set the time. God did. So he says, oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city, which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own but on account of your great compassion. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, take and listen and take action. For your own sake, O oh my God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. Mm. So look how many times your servant for your sake, let your your face shine on your desolate sanction, sanctuary. Open your eyes, the city called by your name, before you on account of, but account of your great compassion. For your own sake, because your city and your people are called by your name. Is that crazy? Mm -hmm. It's all about God. From your city. Now look. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 16, 17, 18, 19. He's praying about God's things. We're yours. The city is yours. The nation is yours. The people are yours. Mercy is yours. Mercy is yours. Mm. So that's crazy. That's what Daniel is thinking about. We belong to you. Only you can fix this. Mm -hmm. Daniel is not saying, Lord, help us to fix it. Mm -hmm. He's saying, only you can do this. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. Now, you know what, what changed here? My sin, my people Israel, my supplication, my God, my God. I read some time that somebody called Christianity the religion of personal pronouns. We are God's people. He is our God. And here's Daniel owning his people Israel, owning his sin, 
and owning that the fact that the Lord is my God And what he's stressing there is relationship. A relationship. And God takes relationship very seriously. He keeps covenant. And you know, he's never going to cast away his people Israel. In Jeremiah, again, God says, if you can break my covenant with night and day, then you can also break the covenant between me and my people. Is that not amazing? So Paul in Romans 9 through 11 can say, has God finished with his people? May it never be. So here's God and here's Israel. And here's Daniel being an intercessor. Praying. And then Gabriel shows up. Gabriel is an angel. And this is the same Angel Gabriel, who announces to Zacharias in Luke chapter 1 and to Mary in Luke chapter 1. Same angel. Here he is coming to Daniel in his extreme weariness. 500 years earlier or so? Yeah. 400, 500 years? Something like that. Yeah. Now, isn't it interesting that Daniel is extremely weary? Mm. Prayer is work. Everybody get that? So is old age. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll give you that. <laughs> this answers the question, can old guys pray? Yes, yes indeed. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Old guys pray. Yeah. You know that t-shirt that says old guys rock. Well, old guys pray. <laughs> <laughs> you young punks. <laughs> and it's the time of the evening offering. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? I don't know if you know that every morning and every evening, it, there was supposed to be a lamb. One year old. Perfect. Every morning and every evening, sacrificed. Mm -hmm. And it really speaks about Jesus being our perfect offering every morning, every evening. So it's the evening offering. Maybe Daniel's been praying all day. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But here's Gabriel showing up. And in verse 22, he says, he gave me instruction and talked with me. And said, oh, Daniel, I've now come forth to give you insight with understanding. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued. And I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Isn't it interesting that God in answer to Daniel's prayer, wants to give him instruction and insight, mm -hmm. understanding. I think that's mm -hmm. fabulous. You know, you can trust that God wants to teach you. And if something perplexes you, you can pray to God and say, hey, how does this work? And he will give you that insight, that understanding that you need. Isaiah 54, all your children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be their peace. So you can ask God to teach you, and he will. So look at this. At the beginning of your supplications, 
The command was issued. God says, hear that? Okay, go. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> now, you know, we what we've been learning is that, like Psalm 27, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. When you said, seek my face, I said to you, Lord, your face I will seek. So who started this prayer? God started it. And this kind of thrills me. You are highly esteemed. That means highly esteemed by God. Is that not amazing? Now, you know, if we were to go through Daniel, and we might do that, I might just start over again in chapter one. Have you ever done Daniel before on a Friday night? Mm -mm. Okay, it's fair game. I'll pray about it. Amen. You see what kind of a guy Daniel is, that he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself, for example, with the king's delicacies. And he set his heart that he would stay holy in Babylon. Now, Babylon wants to erase who you are as a person of God. They gave him new names, made them learn all of the Babylonian wisdom, sciences. Babylon was going to erase Daniel as a person of God. And he said, you know what? I'm not going to. And even in the threat of his life, he said, no, I'm not going to do that. So he's saying, you know, either they give me favor or they kill me. But I'm not going to defile myself. If I die, I'm going to die sanctified to the Lord. And God honored that. So Daniel was separated for God. That is the meaning of holiness. And God highly esteems that. Because when you want to be holy for God, that means you esteem God. So this relationship here is highly esteeming one another. And another word for that is love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Because that's the way God is toward us. So that's why Daniel is interesting. He's a guy who takes his relationship with God seriously, and that's what keeps him alive in Babylon. And now he's getting instruction, insight, understanding. And on top of that, he gets the message. God loves you. How fabulous that is to know that, that God loves you. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. This is also important. Daniel did not just hear it. He saw it. That's what the prophets used to be called, is seers. Because the prophecy was also something they saw. And you'll see this if you read through the prophets. The word of the Lord, which the prophet saw. So look at verse 24. And now we're really getting to it here. Are we going to make it? Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, 
to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. All right. Let's go back and get this word here. Okay. Seventy weeks is a period of seven. And it's similar to the English word dozen. Now, what is a dozen? It's 12. 12 what? Well, it's 12 of whatever. It could be a dozen eggs, but it could be a dozen problems, a dozen sets of underwear, 12 of something. This is the same kind of an idea, only instead of dozen, it's the idea of seven. So then again, the question is, 70 what? Or seven of what? We'll see how we work this out. You mean 77s? 77s. Now, what is 70 times seven? 490. 490. That's right. If 490 somethings, Wow. Yes. Possibly. Let's figure it out. Is it minutes? <laughs> no. <laughs> Months? Maybe. But we'll find that years works the best. So 77s have been decreed by whom? Not Gabriel, God. For your people, who are your people? Uh, the Jews. Mm -hmm. Israel. Right. And your holy city, where's that? Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now, Jerusalem's important because that's the place where God made his name dwell forever. So this is about God's name as well. Mm -hmm. And let's see, one, to finish the transgression. And that is clarified in the next phrase, to mm -hmm. make an end of sin. Mm -hmm. Wow. No more sin. That'll be good. Mm -hmm. To make atonement for iniquity. That is to make everything right. Mm. That's pretty good. Mm. And then fourthly, to bring in everlasting righteousness. This is getting better and better. Fifthly, to seal up vision and prophecy. It's to bring an end to vision and prophecy. That's it. That's all there is. And to anoint the most holy place. Now, the most holy place is in the temple of God. And at this point, there is no temple of God because the temple in Jerusalem has been burned and destroyed by the, that was by the Babylonians, by the Babylonians 70 years ago. Mm. So this is amazing. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of, of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven, seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again.
with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Now, what's 7 and 62? 69. Ah. Uh -huh. Oh, mass yep. <laughs> The 62 weeks. All right. So they divide it up somehow into 7 and 62, but that equals 69. Now, what is 7 times 69? Quick. Oh, dear. <clears throat> Okay. 483. Oh. <laughs> this is what happens when you have iPhone. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now look at that. 483. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Wait a sec. Now... I want to want to back up for a sec. It will be built again, even in times of distress. Jerusalem will be built again. Now, Jerusalem is is a pile of stones. It probably looked kind of like Gaza, only super overgrown with weeds and trees and bushes and junk. And God is saying, Jerusalem will be built again, even in times of distress. And you can read Nehemiah and just realize it was like mission impossible all the way. It's when the decree goes forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, I don't know why it's divided up like that. And it says after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. And that means killed. Mm. And have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. All right. <laughs> people of the mm. prince who is to come. Mm. Now, this is already historical. Mm. Because the Romans destroyed the city and the temple in 70 AD. Mm which means Messiah had to come before the destruction of the temple. And a fellow named Sir Robert Anderson worked this out. Uh, he wrote a book called The Coming of the Prince. And it's a part of scripture. It's Nehemiah chapter 2, which... Sir Robert Anderson reckoned to be 1st of March, 440, now I can't remember, 444 BC. Wow. That's Artaxerxes. Mm. And he gave the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And if you count 483 years from there, you get Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Wow. Hmm. Now, hmm. after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be ki killed. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, can you imagine... All this is fulfilled right now. Hmm. It has happened. Right up until this. Its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And then we have what is known as a gap. Because verse 27 has not happened. Hmm. And you think, what?
because this hasn't happened yet. So let's look. He will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Whoa, what does that mean? Seven years. There's a seven year period that hasn't happened yet. You know, mm. it's like there's a clock and we've had this countdown of 483 years and there's seven years left to go. Everything else has happened. But then the clock stopped and it's mm. like, what? But this happens a lot in the prophecy, in the Old Testament. There's a gap. And we still have seven years of this left to go. Mm. So, he, who is he? The prince who is to come. Hey. Hey. Wife, I love you. He is, it says, the people of the prince who is to come. So it's the people are not the prince. The prince who is to come is this guy. So there's a prince coming. And he's not Messiah. He will make a firm covenant with the many. Now, that's pretty good. There's a lot of people he's making a covenant with. And you only make a covenant to make peace. Hmm. It's for peace. Everybody's going to be happy. Many people are going to be happy. Hmm. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice. Now, that's interesting. Mm. because you can't have sacrifice without a temple. Mm. And the sanctuary was destroyed. So it seems fair to conjecture that part of the covenant is going to be about making a temple. And now we can maybe guess who some of the many are. Some of those have to be the Muslims. Because right now, the Dome of the Rock is on the Temple Mount. And the Muslims will not be very kindly disposed to having the Jewish temple built right next to it. Can you imagine that happening? Now, if anybody could come along and make a covenant so that the Muslims are happy, would that not be acknowledged as a miracle? Yeah. And wouldn't it be possible to say about this guy, who can make war against him? This guy is the most PC guy on the planet. He's phenomenal. Yeah. He makes peace where Joe Biden in the United States could not make peace. Vladimir Putin could not make peace. But this guy made peace with everybody. And we've got peace and safety. Unbelievable. Mm. This guy is phenomenal. Yeah. Except we have the ominous word but yeah. oh oh suddenly you have the theme music <laughs> but -dun. But -dun. Uh oh but -dun, but -dun, but -dun, but -dun. <laughs> <laughs> there's a shark in this prophecy <laughs> middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice what's half a seven three and a half three and a half if you look in the book of revelation three and a half shows up quite a lot you got to be aware of that well guess what it comes right from here in the middle of the week 
he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. A complete destruction is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Wow. So this guy who comes on as a miracle peace worker turns out to be the abomination that causes desolation. Wow. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be completely destroyed. Wow. So just to cheat a little bit, we'll go to the place where this fella turns up again. It's Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let mm -hmm. no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And there you have defined what is the abomination that causes desolation. The man of lawlessness, the son of destruction. And Paul says, don't you remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things. And you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accordance with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved." For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that wow. they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. All right. This is bad stuff when this guy shows up. And... It's really a judgment on all those who did not receive a love of the truth to be saved. So you don't want to be those who reject Jesus, who reject the truth. You don't even want to postpone the truth and say, yeah, okay, okay, but... Maybe, you know, when I'm old and on my deathbed, maybe then I'll slip in a quick, hey, save me right now. God is merciful. I'm not God, but I would not recommend that. Because what you really want is to receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Don't you want the truth? Do you want to just play with deception? Because this guy is going to have all power and signs and false wonders, the activity of Satan to deceive. Deception of wickedness. Do you want to be deceived? Mm -hmm. Is it fun? Yeah. I think it's better to receive the love of the truth right now. And love the truth and go for it. 
embrace the truth, be of the truth. You mm. see, he says, we should always give thanks to God for you, beloved brethren, by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So receive the love of Jesus. When you have Jesus in your heart, and he is your Savior and your Lord, then he is the way to the Father. And you don't have to worry about being deceived because he will give you that love for the truth. And I think you become allergic to lies. You become very impatient when somebody shovels a bunch of lies at you because, you know, it's not about Jesus. I'm not interested. All I want is Jesus. That becomes your attitude. So we're going to have to leave it here. And obviously, verse 27 is not the last word about what happens in the end times. But it's a beginning, isn't it? And mm -hmm. we get a clear picture. Now, 483 years out of this prophecy are already fulfilled. Yeah. So what are the chances that the last seven aren't going to be fulfilled? Uh, they worked out the percentages, and it comes out to be 0%. So mm -hmm. here we have something that must be fulfilled because, well, a large percentage of it is already fulfilled. And I, for that, I was going to whip out my calculator. Oh. If you divide, let's say, 7 by 69, or let's say what? I don't know how to work out the percentages on this. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> a very small percentage. What percent of 70 is 7? So you take 7, okay. and 70. Yes. So it says 1%, 10%. 10%. 1%. 1%. 10 out of 70 is 10%. Okay. So... <laughs> Don't you love just getting taught unbelievable truth here? <laughs> let's not talk about percentages. Higher math. Yeah, let's talk about truth. God is going to fulfill these last seven years because he's already fulfilled 483 of them. Mm -hmm. And... When he's ready, those seven years are going to be uninterrupted. No more gaps. No more delays. That's Revelation chapter 10, if you want to read that. No more delays. Hmm. When those seven years begin, nothing can stop those, which means the return of Jesus So here in Daniel chapter 9, we have his first coming and the hint of his second coming. Because that complete destruction that's going to be on this man of lawlessness is going to come directly from Jesus. Paul says he will slay him with the breath of his mouth. And for that complete destruction to happen, that means Jesus has to come back and do it himself personally. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking forward to. We're not looking forward to the abomination that causes desolation. We're looking forward to Jesus. So I think we're going to leave it there. Rob. Yes, sir. I divided seven by 483. 
giving you a 99.99% probability that okay. that will come. So it's a 0.01% opportunity not. I don't know if that's correct, but I'm just saying 7 divided by 483 gives you a 99.9% probability that that will happen. Let's just say this. Yes. 99.9 .9 has already happened. Mm -hmm. Yes. And God doesn't do 99% fulfillment. No. Yeah. So we're looking for 100% fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry. That's a better way. Yeah. Mm. But just mm -hmm. think, 99% of this prophecy has already happened, and we know it has happened. It's already yeah. historical. So verse 27 is historical. Just as much as these preceding verses are historical. Jesus is coming back in history. Time and space. I believe he's going to come in our lifetime. Amen. I'll leave it at that. Even so. Any more comments or questions? <clears throat> okay. Keep those cards and letters coming. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are the one and only God. And we praise you that you know the end from the beginning. And we thank you that you have laid it out in Scripture. And we're so thankful that we can look back now and see how exactly you have fulfilled prophecy in the past. And we realize you will fulfill the rest of this prophecy because you've already determined judgment on this man of wickedness, this prince who is to come. You've already determined that he will be completely destroyed. And we praise you that Jesus is the one who will destroy him. We're so glad that we don't have to be anxious about the future because we asked Jesus to come into our hearts and to save us from our sins, just like Daniel prayed. We can't stand on our own goodness because all we've done is break your law ignore you, treat you badly. We thank you for having mercy on us and judging our sins on Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for raising him from the dead. Thank you that he is in heaven for us right now. And thank you that he's coming back. Mm -hmm. And we pray, all of us tonight, that we would be ready for his return and the end of this age. Mm -hmm. Don't let us be unprepared, Lord. Mm -hmm. Let us be ready and waiting and watching. Mm -hmm. We pray that you would work in us, and we thank you for that. Keep us now as we go. We thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. We won't be here then.